Well, thank you, Sterling. Hey, y'all, y'all give Sterling and our band a big hand for leading us in worship this morning, man. I'm grateful. Sterling's from Houston, so that means he had to cross the causeway to get here. So that's, that's a big deal, you know. Um, hey, listen, uh, if you weren't here last week, you missed something special. Uh, it was Serve the City Sunday, and that's one of my favorite weeks of the year. Um, because I don't have to preach. Um, no, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite weeks of the year. It's, it's a Sunday where our whole church goes out and serves in the community. And uh, we had all sorts of projects. Uh, some were gardening kind of projects. Um, uh, some were, were working in people's homes. Some were working with some of our partners. Uh, but it's really a chance for our church to, to move from the seats to the streets. It's a, a chance for our our church to, to not only communicate the gospel with our words, but to, to demonstrate that we actually believe it by putting our money where our mouth is. Like it, it's where we put our efforts into to showing, hey, we really do care about this community. It's not just about, hey, y'all come to us, come to church, but we want to come to you. We want to be where you are. And so I'm so grateful for you guys and the way that you served. Uh, the, the feedback that we've gotten from people in the community has just been so encouraging. I've gotten texts and emails and thank you notes and uh, people have posted on social media just about how awesome you were, just bragging on you and the great job that you did. And so I just want to, on behalf of our, our leadership team, just say thank you for serving. If you went out and participated in that, uh, I'm so grateful for you guys. And, and not just for serving on one kind of Sunday morning for a few hours. I mean, that, that, that's cool. It's cool. But, but what is, is even better is that our church really has this DNA of service 12 months of the year. That, that you guys are always serving outside the walls of our church. And I'm so grateful for that. And hopefully, if, if maybe you encountered an organization that we partner with that you think, man, I, I'd actually like to volunteer with them on a regular basis. I hope you'll, you'll take some next steps to be involved and to start partnering. Now, the feedback that we got from Serve the City was awesome. But I want to ask you a question. What, what if it wasn't? Like, what if... What if people didn't really appreciate your hard work? Would you still serve? I mean, it's, it's nice when people appreciate the things that you do for them, right? Like, that, that's a normal thing, to, to appreciate when they appreciate you, right? Like, it feels good when you know that you made a difference and that they value your contribution, whether that was your time or your money. And so it, it feels good when they express that. But what if they don't? What if they never say thank you? Or what if they're even hostile to to you trying to help them? Like you're trying your best to share something that's positive and they don't necessarily give a good response. I think think how we deal with, with both praise and the lack of praise is incredibly telling about us. There's, there's a proverb that has always struck me. It's Proverbs 27, 21. It says, a hot furnace tests silver and gold. Basically, it, it sorts out the impurities from the real metal. But people are tested by the praise that they receive. In other words, when, when someone comes to you and says, man, you are so awesome. You are so great. Uh, you are pretty. You is smart. Like, like when they say those things to you, like, do you let it go to your head and it, it cause you to be prideful? Or do you, are you able to stay humble? Are you, are you able to give glory to where glory is due? So I think we, we're, we're tested by praise, but we're also tested by lack of praise. Like we're, we're tested by not receiving the praise that we think that we deserve. And I think sometimes it's in the lack of praise that sometimes our true motives are actually revealed. Because if, if the reason we do what we do is to receive praise from humans, then that's our reason. Right? Like that's, that's actually our true motivation. It's, it's, not, it's not born out of this desire to serve God and advance his kingdom. It's actually not really about him. It's actually really about us. And so today, I want to dive into a story 
in the book of Acts about a guy who, who, who really does serve well. But his, his story is, is pretty complicated when it comes to seeking the, the approval and the praise of people. So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter uh, 12. We're in cha- Acts chapter 12 today. Um, if you don't have a Bible with you, the words are going to be on the screen and uh, you can follow along. They're also in your program notes. Um, so a little bit of background. We've been in the study of Acts and we, we've kind of jumped around and, and Acts actually jumps around too. Like you've got a couple different storylines that Acts is tracing in this point. Uh, you have basically the, the, the Acts of the Apostles would be like the full name of this book, but it's really the acts of God through the apostles. And, and you got a couple key characters. Uh, we, we've been talking about this guy named Saul of Tarsus, who, who later becomes known uh, as Paul, the apostle Paul. But then you also have this guy named Peter. And we read a lot about Peter, if you ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because Peter was one of Jesus's main disciples. He, in fact, he was one of the closest guys to Jesus. And there were many times where, where Peter was the first one to raise his hand in Sunday school. Like, like Jesus would ask the question, say, hey, what do you guys think about this? And Peter's like, hey, I know, I know, I know. He was not shy. He was not bashful. Uh, he, he was actually one of those guys that, that really, on the outside, seemed uber confident. In fact, when Jesus was arrested, Peter is the guy that cut off one of the Roman soldiers' ears. Like you'd say, man, he's a man of action, a man of courage. But then that same guy, after Jesus was arrested, Peter was asked by a couple people, hey, do you know this Jesus that was just arrested? And what did he do? He denied. He's like, man, I don't don't know Jesus. They're like, yeah, yeah. I noticed y'all are Facebook friends. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure y'all know each other. Like, I've seen y'all together. You're literally wearing a Jesus t-shirt. Um, he's like, nah, nah, never, never heard, never heard of Jesus. Um, why? Because even though Peter was outwardly courageous, inwardly, he feared what other people thought. He feared man. And that became a struggle for him, really, the the rest of his life. Later on, one of the conflicts that we read about in the book of Acts is is this constant, ongoing conflict of whether or not the Gentiles needed to be circumcised before they could be fully accepted into the church. And Peter was one of the first people who realized, hey, listen, the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. Like he, God revealed that to Peter and he stands up, he says they don't. But then some of the 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 Judaizers, some from the circumcision party, actually start to put pressure on Peter, and he actually starts to kind of go back on that a little bit. And so um, the Apostle Paul ends up calling Peter out on it. So, so Peter is one of those guys that is outwardly courageous. He, he's, he's an extroverted guy, and yet he was susceptible to the fear of man and worrying what people thought. And in in today's story, what I I want you to see is I want you to keep in mind that this is the same Peter who once denied that Jesus was his rabbi. He once denied that he even knew Jesus. And now I want you to see his stand for Jesus. Acts chapter 12, we'll start in verse 1. Check this out. This is pretty cool. It says this, it says, about that time, and and when I say about that time, that's kind of like Acts is jumping around, right? Like, so about the same time that the Apostle Paul is doing his missionary stuff, about that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church. And he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. Now, King Herod is a familiar name in the Bible. And you think, man, this King Herod guy, he must have been really old. Um, actually, it's, it's the grandson of the King Herod that tried to have Jesus killed when, when Jesus was a baby. This is Herod Agrippa. And so he was put in charge of Israel by the Roman government, partly because his grandmother was Jewish. And because his, his grandmother was Jewish, 
Herod got to claim that he's one of the Jews. Like, hey, I'm like you guys. I'm one of y'all. But really, he's a Roman. Like, really, at his heart of hearts, he is loyal to Rome. But he knows how to play the Jewish game. And Herod Agrippa would go to the synagogue and read from uh, the, the scriptures every day. Um, we know that from other ancient sources that he would appear very devoted and religious, that he was working kind of the Jewish religious system. But it was all part of his strategy to make sure that Israel stayed submissive to Roman rule and reign. He wanted to make sure that he was keeping the Jews happy, that they were, they were, they were cool with him and that he would have influence with them, even though he was a puppet king to Rome. And so he knows that the Jewish people, the, the, legal, the, the legal kind of guys that were always out to get Jesus are now out to get the, the Christians. He knows that if, hey, listen, if I, if I go after these Christians, it's going to make uh, my constituency really happy. Like they're going to be pumped about this. So he has one of the, the key apostles, one of the key leaders in the early church, James, arrested and executed. And it says he was put to death by the sword. Now, that's a pretty interesting uh, detail. Why would scripture include that, hey, this is how he died. He was put to death by the sword. Because execution by the sword was reserved for a, a very specific type of crime. You would be executed by the sword, according to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 13, if you were guilty of leading others astray to worship a false god. That's the, the prescription in Jewish law. And so Herod, who knows Jewish law and is playing out to his base, says, hey, listen, these guys are, are, are these, these Christians are actually the heretics. Like these Christians are the ones who are leading people away from God. We got to stamp them out. And so he claims Deuteronomy 13 and says, we're going to, we're going to execute him by the sword. And then you can tell he's, he's got a plan. He's going to start going after some other guys. And so verse three, it says, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too. And that was a big fish. I mean, Peter was a big name. That's a big deal. But he did so during the festival of unleavened bread. Now, again, scripture is filled with all sorts of uh, interesting little details. And it's, it's significant that Peter was arrested during the Passover. Because during the Passover, one of the cultural trends was that you couldn't have someone executed. There was, there was like a stay on execution during the, the, the feast time period. <coughs> And so instead of having them immediately executed, he had him arrested. And he says, okay, we're just going to lock him up in jail until Passover is over. And then when it's over, then we'll have him executed. And then everyone's going to be happy. I'm going to be a hero. People are going to think I'm awesome. Like my approval ratings are going to go up. It's, it's going to be good. So verse 4 says, after the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. And intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. Now, if you've taken notes, I want you to just underline that word praying fervently, praying fervently. You know, sometimes we, we read scripture and we, we, we miss the emotion behind it. But, but I want you to imagine this. Imagine that you're part of the early church, okay? Like you're, you're in the group. And in, in one, of, one of your friends, like this isn't just a guy that you've heard of, one of your, your close friends who happens to be one of the leaders of the early church has just been arrested and killed. And now, now they came after like the main guy. The, the main guy that you look to for leadership. Peter, Peter at this point is like, the, the head of the church in Jerusalem. Like he's the guy that people would, would really care about. Like his, his word carried a lot of weight. Like people really cared about what Peter had to say. And all of a sudden you find out now Peter's arrested. And you're worried about Peter. 
You're like, man, this, this is not looking good. You ever been part of a, a small group Bible study or been in a situation where someone asks you to pray for something? You're like, man, I'll, I'll pray for that. You know, there's a difference between saying that you're going to pray for something and praying fervently. You ever had those, those moments where you had to really pray fervently? Like, where, where like you find out that someone is in the hospital that you love and it's really serious. And man, you just drop to your knees and you pray for real. Or maybe you're going through a relational issue or there's something going on in your life. And it's not just a, a, a sweet little prayer request. Like, where you say... God, thank you for this food, blah, 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 amen, you know, like, no, like, you are praying, and that's the picture that I imagine here, is the early church gets together, and they say, man, we are going to pray fervently, like, passionately, consistently, authentically, that our friend Peter would be released, that, that something would happen, that God would intervene. Now, I can stop there and say, man, isn't that a cool picture of how the church cares for its own and how, how we as followers of Jesus are supposed to interact with each other. But, but I, at the beginning of the message, I told you um, that you really get to see something in Peter that I think is significant. Because remember, Peter's the guy that, after Jesus was arrested, denied that he even knew Jesus three times. Peter's the coward. And now... Peter is standing up for Jesus. One of his best friends is ar arrested and executed. And what, what it doesn't happen is that Peter is like, man, I'm out of here. Like, they're, they're out for the apostles. They're, they're coming to get me. It's not safe here anymore. So, so it, the text doesn't say, so Peter left and fled to safety. No, Peter stayed and continued to minister. Peter stayed and continued to do the things that God had called him to do. Why? What changed in Peter? What changed between the night that Jesus was betrayed and Acts chapter 12? Peter saw a resurrected Jesus. That's what happened. And it completely changed the way he thought about his life. See, but the first time, Peter just finds out that his Messiah, his rabbi, is arrested. And he's worried that he just wasted the last three years of his life. Like his hopes and his dreams that Jesus would bring about the kingdom, that he would overthrow the Roman government, like he would bring in this new era. Man, he's just feeling his world crush. And now he's worried that he's next. And so out of fear and disappointment, he denies Jesus. But then a few days later, he sees a resurrected Jesus. And that gave him confidence to live differently. And guys, can I just tell you, as we read this story of, of the apostles in the book of Acts, you see their boldness. You, you see the, the fact that they're willing to take these steps of faith and, and risk. You know why? You know why they were so bold? Because they saw Jesus after he had been crucified. And they were absolutely convinced that, that death is not the end of the story. They're absolutely convinced that Jesus really is the Messiah, that he is who he says he is. And when he makes promises, that he has the power to fulfill his promises. And so now Peter has a, a newfound confidence and says, listen, man, you, you can arrest me. You can have me killed. Because I know Jesus. And I know he's already defeated sin and death. And there's actually nothing you can do to me. Because I have a Savior. That's what's happening here. Now, when Peter's in his jail cell, do you think he prayed? Probably. I would guess he did. I don't know what he prayed. My guess is, is that maybe he did pray for God to rescue him. We know that the church prayed for God to intervene. But my guess is that Peter's like, okay, God, if this is it, if this, this is my turn to suffer and die for your name's sake, then here I am. I am willing. 
I imagine that, that Peter actually wasn't just super afraid. He didn't have a death wish, but he also wasn't afraid either. But Herod was. Herod was really afraid that something was happening, so he surrounds Peter with a bunch of guards. And, and here's what happened. This is pretty interesting. Um, it says this in, in verse 6. It says, when Herod was about to bring him out for trial that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrist. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. See, that's uh, biblical proof that flip-flops are okay. Um, and he did. He says, wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know that what the angel did was really happening. But he thought he was seeing a vision. Yeah, you'll see what's happening. So, so Peter is surrounded by guards. And then in the middle of the night, an angel comes and, and a light shines. And he's like, hey, wake up. <laughs> wake up. And Peter's like, huh, huh, huh. <laughs> and he's like, follow me. Let's go. And so they leave. They just leave prison. And Peter's like, is this a dream? Is this really happening? And then he kind of looks around. And he's like, no, this, this is real. It says, after they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. And they went outside and passed one street. And then suddenly the angel left them. Like, wouldn't this make a, a great movie scene? Like, I mean, this is like the ulti ultimate prison break. I mean, just, just supernaturally. God rescues Peter. There's nothing Peter did to rescue himself. There's nothing Peter did to, to devise some escape plan or, or work his way out or talk his way out. It's 100% God's intervention. God rescues Peter. And Peter knows it too. Verse, verse 11 says, When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people expected. Peter came to a really important conclusion. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. It's pretty simple. He came to this conclusion. The Lord has rescued me. He was under no illusion that anyone else had. It, he knew it was, it was the Lord. It was God who had saved him. And, and can, I, can I just submit to you that if you had to to put something on your, your tombstone one day, this would be a pretty good thing to put on your tombstone. <laughs> like, this is the story of my life. The Lord has rescued me. Like, this is the story of Christianity. The story of, not, is, of Christianity is not, hey, listen, man, I tried really, really hard to be a good person. And I just did my best. And I, and, and I hope that God, at the end of my life, when we get to heaven... He'll look at all the good. He'll look at all the bad. And, and maybe it'll, it'll, it'll weigh out. And the good stuff will weigh more than the bad stuff. And he'll say, ah, come on in. I'll grade on a curve. That, that's not Christianity. Christianity is this. I'm a sinner who actually deserves to go to hell. I'm a sinner whose sin separates me from a holy God. And yet... God loved me enough to send Jesus, to send his only son, to live a perfect life and to die on the cross for my sins and to, to have victory over sin and death by, by rising again on the third day. And so now when I, I, I place my trust, I don't put my, my trust in myself. I don't put my, my trust in my religiosity or my churchianity. I put myself in Jesus. And so this is my story. The Lord has rescued me. The Lord has rescued me. Guys, I, I don't know where you're at this morning. And, and I, I do want to encourage you that there may be times in your life where you find yourself 
in, in circumstances that are heavy and they are hard. And, and can I tell you, God cares about the real things that are going on in your life. He cares about your health. He cares about your finances. He cares about your marriage. He cares about your family. He cares about your friendships. He, he cares about all that stuff. And so when you, you pray, you can pray with him with authenticity, knowing that he cares and that he has the ability and the power to do something about it. And he may choose to rescue you in the same way that he chose to rescue Peter from that, that jail cell. But God doesn't always choose to rescue us out of our circumstances. He didn't rescue James at the beginning of Acts chapter 12, did he? And later on, guess how Peter dies? He's crucified, upside down. He didn't rescue Peter then. See, sometimes God chooses to intervene in our life to, to change our circumstances. And when he does, give him praise, like give him glory for that. Sometimes he chooses to heal. Sometimes he chooses to restore a marriage. Sometimes he chooses to help, help, help bring a job where you had no job or help you financially. Or sometimes he chooses to let you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but he promises to be there with you in that valley and in those moments, he says, man, I'm trying to get your attention. Will you trust me? Am I enough? And in those days, you can say, whether he changes your circumstances or not, you'll be able to say, hey, God has actually rescued me. Because at the end of the day, it's not my circumstances that matter most. It's my eternity. And he has rescued me from my sin. He has rescued me from eternal death. And he has brought me into life. And he has brought me into his family. And, and there's nothing this world can do that will hold me back. And that's the story of the gospel. And, and listen, if, if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, if, if there's never been a point in your life where you say, you know what, man, I, I need a rescuer and I need Jesus to rescue me, but I, I've never actually experienced that sort of rescue, uh, you can today. And here's the deal, is it's actually not, it's not that complicated. That, 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 that journey just begins really just by asking God to rescue you. And to, by admitting your sin. And so I, I want to lead you in prayer. If you, if you don't mind, guys, just bow your head. And there may be people in the room. I don't, I don't know what brought you here this morning. Maybe you've got friends or family that invited you. But, but maybe you're here this morning. And if you're just honest enough to say, you know what? Man, I don't have that relationship with, with Jesus. And, and I know that my life is a mess. And I know that I'm in need of rescue. And in the same way that, prison, that, that Peter was in that prison cell surrounded by guards, unable to escape in himself, the Bible makes it really clear, like, man, we are held captive by our sin. That freedom only comes through Christ. We don't experience freedom in our own power. We experience when he intervenes on our behalf. And so this morning, if you just need rescue, would you take a moment to just to ask God for rescue in your life? You need God's help, his intervention. Maybe it's, maybe it's for something you're walking through in your relationships, something at home, maybe with a friend, maybe it's a coworker, a classmate. Maybe you're walking through some financial stress right now and, and you just need you need help. Say, God, will you rescue me from this? Maybe it's a, a physical health issue. Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's for a family member. And you're just crying out for rescue this morning. Would you do that? Cry out on, on, on their behalf, on your behalf. God, will you rescue? Will you save?
But I do believe there may be some of you in this room who have never actually experienced that sort of rescue, the eternal rescue that I'm talking about. And if, if that's you this morning, would you just in your own words say, God, I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness in my life. Will you rescue me? Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And I give my life to you. Just pray that in your own words. Hey guys, I'll look back up here. Listen, if, if you, you prayed that prayer this morning, um, you know, we would love to help you process what God is doing in your heart. And so we've got a great prayer team in the back. And after the service, uh, please go talk to those guys and just let them know what God's doing in your heart this morning. Um, you can talk to them. Or if you want, man, come find me or even just email us. You can scan the QR code Andreas talked about earlier in the service and, and just shoot us a message and say, hey, listen, I'd like to talk to someone about what it means to follow Jesus. But don't let this moment get away from you. Like, take, take a next step. But for those of you who are already followers of Jesus, I, I think it's important for us to regularly go back to, to what Christianity is all about. It's not about churchianity. It's not about being good people. It's not even about going to serve out in the city. And it's about the grace of God poured out on our lives because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we come back to it over and over again. And one of the ways we celebrate that grace is by taking the Lord's Supper. And so if you walked in this morning, you may have noticed there's a, a basket with little, little cups. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, whether you're a member of our church or not, uh, we want to invite you to participate. Uh, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then uh, this is a chance for you just to kind of watch and, and check out what we're doing here. But, but this really is reserved for those of you who have committed your lives to Jesus Christ. So we've got our, our communion cups. And if you'll do a couple things, you can, um, the, the bottom part has a, a little cracker on it. So you can pull that out. So get the, the little wafer. And then on the top, you can remove the top and you've got the juice. So on that same night that Peter faltered and failed and denied, he knew Jesus. Jesus actually knew that he would, but he gathered with his disciples in an upper room and he was celebrating the Passover meal. And he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, you do so in remembrance of me. As you reflect on Jesus' willingness to die on the cross on your behalf. Man, what a, what a beautiful gift of grace. He said, and this is my blood. It represents a new covenant. Whenever you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And then he said, whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do so until I come again. Pointing us to the fact that even though we live in this broken, sinful, messed up world, this is not the end of the story. And in the same way that Peter was confident, knowing that, hey, listen, they can arrest me, they can kill me this time, or they can kill me later, whatever they decide to do, it's not gonna hold me back. And we know that, that we have a king who is coming. And he restores all things. That's where our confidence comes from. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for your word this morning. And um, even just for, for real stories of real people like Peter, who uh, weren't always perfect, who oftentimes failed, 
But yet, God, you give us so much grace. God, restore us to us just this this sense of, of wonder and appreciation for what you've done for us on the cross. And, and let that be our motivation for doing good. God, let us not grow weary and lose heart. God, give us your perspective, a heavenly, eternal kingdom perspective. I pray this in Jesus' name.